Hey everybody, welcome to IB History of the Americas. This is a flipped lecture on the beginning of peacemaking, peacekeeping, inter international relations from 1919 to 1936. Um, this is a very important topic that you guys need to know. So I think having these lectures at home could be pretty useful for you. You can pause this, you can rewind it, um, anything like that whenever you miss something. So I hope this is going to help out and um, let's get started. Oh, one more thing. This is also a paper one topic. This is all paper one is about. So make sure you know it well. You know it well. Um, you learn the tricks on paper one. We'll go through them in class, how to write the exam and such. But you do that well, um, then you can get a great mark on paper one. So let's get started. Now, when talking about uh, peacemaking, peacekeeping, international relations, this is the time period between the two wars. Okay? Let's first talk about the impacts of World War I. Well, everybody's absolutely shocked at the Armageddon-like experience of World War I. Okay, people had gone into the war with the idea that war was, um, it was romanticized, it was um, adventurous, you know, it was all about honor and, and respect and duty, and, and um, it was quite the honor to be able to go out and fight for your country, and then of course you'd come home with some medals, you know, maybe a little bit of a limp, but it wouldn't be too bad. But it, it was really, really um, a, a big part of everyone's lives. Okay, this whole idea of how great war was was completely shattered by the reality of millions of deaths. Therefore, people are searching for desperately for any alternative to war, no matter how unlikely it could be. First of all, the map changed incredibly. As we can see over here, we have this is pre World War One, and we have um, monarchies. Okay, the Russian Empire, Austria-Hungary, Ottoman Empire. These collapsed, and republicanism was now in to an extent because you can look at Russia. That wasn't um, a republic. Instead. Lenin takes over and now revolutionary ideology is on the scene. And here, this challenges the very pillars of Western society. Okay, things like um, religion, property, family, democracy, individualism. These things are all challenged by communism. Also, um, this, this brought a lot of fear in the West in regards to um, their own little communist movements in each individual country. Okay, people were fearful as France, Germany, okay, every everywhere they all had their own um, communist groups and they were scared that they might be able to take over. Okay, this brings a lot of fear, thinking maybe anarchy could happen as well. Alright, now, Versailles, um, this was also incredibly harsh, but the thing that happened with Versailles is that um, Europeans, World War I convinced Europeans that another war would see the end of civilization. So they felt they had to take whatever, they had to do whatever it took to avoid another war. You guys are going to be reading about this and, and answering some questions in regards to this. So I won't go into too much detail, but. Um, it was harsh on Germany. Now let's talk about revisionism. Germany and Russia are not too happy with the results of the First World War. So this leads to their own little agreement between each other in order to kind of circumvent what happens at Versailles. Now when I talk about revisionism, what I mean is that Germany and Russia were not content with what happened at Versailles. So once they were able to regain their strength eventually they would they would seek to make revisions to the re, the results of world war one that's what revisionism is so um think germany they have resentment over their own treatment after the war okay versailles all the areas that their anger over um they felt disrespected okay they lost in regards to territory they lost 13 percent of their population Okay? They lost 12% of their land. Their country is nearly split in two through the Polish corridor over here. All right, 
they also lost Alsace and Lorraine to France right over here. Now this is historically a very very um, contentious piece of land as they would always fight over it um, wanting it. Also according to the Paris Peace Conferences um, one of the ideals that came out of it was that countries were allowed to have self-determination. Now that means that if you lived in a area you were allowed to move say you were Hungarian okay you were allowed to move to Hungary and your country was allowed to have the idea of self-determination you have your own free will of that country your country now now Germans who lived outside of Germany they um, were not allowed to enter the Weimar Republic okay so that's Germany's who are in Austria and Czechoslovakia they're not allowed to come back into Germany also, the new countries that are a result of the breaking up the Austrian-Hungarian Empire are new countries that are relatively young in their lifespan, so they're quite weak. This represented then a big power vacuum that could become a temptation to Germany that when they perhaps were to regain their strength would be quite easy pickings. And if you think about it, the um, Eastern powers that were fighting against uh, Germany in the east such as the uh, the Russian Empire it's not there anymore it's been moved back so really this would be quite easy for Germany to be able to move in over here in regards to revisionism Russia would also be seeking to change some of the results of the Versailles and the Paris Peace Conferences now what happened is Russia, at this point in time, right away after World War I, they're not in a position to be able to um, make moves in uh, regaining lost territory. Okay, They are weak. They had just previously fought a war against Poland Okay, in the early 20s, and they lost. All right, um, They also are hardly surviving after their own civil war. Um, after Bolshevism took over and so they're not really in a position to um, take back lost territory but once they would become strong they would definitely search for um, a revision to the results of World War I as well so the result of Russian and German revisionism is the Treaty of Rapallo in 1922 now what the Treaty of Rapallo is is that they formally renounced all um, war debts and things from the Treaty of Versailles and it was essentially a treaty of friendship but there were secret clauses involved now um, German officers were able to go to Russia and what they would do is they would then train Russian troops um, about modern war techniques things like that in exchange um, the Russians would uh, give Germans um, different facilities, things like that, able to all kind of keep the military modernized and keep tactics up to date and to really train a brand new Soviet um, army. So this was quite devious and really what it did is it allowed Germany to escape the disarmament clause of Versailles. It is also foreshadowing of the alliance that Germany is going to have with the Soviet Union when World War II comes. Now, let's talk about the Little Entente. Okay, this is kind of like the Little Entente that could, or maybe could not. This is around 1921, and what it was essentially was an agreement between a number of new states. Um, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Romania. So we've got Czechoslovakia here, Yugoslavia here. What it was is that they wanted to join an agreement to protect themselves from the irredentist claims. Irredentist means a desire to recover former territory. So any irredentist claims from maybe Germany or the Soviet Union, um, how they and their revisionism, remember, how they'd want to take over. Now, this alliance was supported by France, which gives it a lot of legitimacy, okay? They were looking for a new ally as they had lost their old buddy Russia over here, okay? So they're looking to ally um, with the Little Entente. Eventually, they also signed an alliance with Poland, but this is where it starts to, to fall apart because at this time, Poland was the most powerful of the new states 
and would have made this alliance much stronger, but Poland and Czechoslovakia couldn't really get along um, over this little area down here called Teshin. Um, it's very mineral, mineral rich. Okay, both countries were claiming it, and so due to this, they couldn't get along, and this poisoned their relationship. This made this agreement impossible. Also, let's talk about American and British isolationism. This is another aspect of this time period. Okay, now the U.S. was isolationist because it's kind of how they did things back then. All right. They have a history of it. Think of the Monroe Doctrine, okay? The idea that you only focus on your own hemisphere, okay? America focuses on America. Europe, stay out of our business. It's the idea, American exceptionalism. We're better than you. We don't, we don't want to deal with your problem. Stay away from us, all right? So it's kind of how the U.S. was before World War I and then after World War I. They went back to that. Now, Britain also is isolationist because... They're just scared of France because every time they have an alliance with France, they end up in a war somewhere. So they want to stay out of any agreement with France because they're scared that they would get pulled into a war. So France was seeking the Anglo-American guarantee. All right, This was never ratified by the U.S. Senate and therefore France was left out to dry. Finally, there were disarmament conferences, okay? These are things that went, uh, that happened after Versailles that were used to um, continue on and avoid war as the decades progressed. First, the most important ones that we're gonna talk about are the Washington Naval Conference. This happened in 1921. Uh, 1922 this was pretty important here what they agreed upon was a navy that was a ratio of five five and three and this what we're talking about is the united kingdom the united states and japan so the united kingdom and the united states would be equivalent to the fives and japan would be equivalent to the three so if the united states it if the size of the united states navy was this big then japan's navy would have to be this big okay as they had further naval conferences they kind of increased the size but the ratios essentially stayed the same really this is the only successful conference because most disarmament conferences don't really address the real issue at play and that's the arms race okay at this time as you can see there were some serious power vacuums all over the world Okay, China is also having its own issues. We're going to talk a lot more detail about those different things. And the, but as there's power vacuums, people are wanting to step into those places and take power. That means to do that, you need weapons. Therefore, arms races are happening despite the hope for disarmament. And so, as the decades went on, disarmament, it got more and more difficult. Okay, tougher degree on issues. All right, so I have a question for you guys. What you can do now is you can go onto the Moodle and you can write a, a quick response, um, maybe 200 words to this question here. What do you think are the reasons for the lack of agreement on arms reductions as the world entered into the 1930s? Now, go beyond what was said in this lecture. I wanna know what you think. I wanna know your knowledge. Go online. Go on the Moodle. I've already posted the question there in the forum. The forum is entitled uh, Lack of Arms Reductions, and the question is posted there. Um, write a response, and then in class, we're going to talk about that. So write a response, do some research, find out what were things in the 1930s, okay, late 1920s that really affected this. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and good luck.